Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation 3. Now, if you're new with us or somebody is joining us online for the first time, as I just said, we are working our way through the book of Revelation here at Calvary on Wednesday night. We are currently in chapter 3. Uh, which is part of the second main division of the book. Chapter 1 is the first main section. Chapters 2 and 3, the things that pertain to the church, is the second main section. And then uh, chapters 4 through the end of the book is the final section. Uh, but we are in chapter 3. Last week we started looking at the sixth letter of the seven that Jesus dictated to the churches of Asia Minor the letter to the church of Philadelphia. As we said last time, the church of Philadelphia, which the name means uh, this, the brotherly love, so it's the city of brotherly love. But the church of Philadelphia wasn't a perfect church. We talked about that last week. No church is. But it was a good church, and it was a faithful church. It was a church that was living for the Lord in such a way that along with the church of Smyrna, was a church Jesus had no words of correction or condemnation for. Last week we looked at verse 7, and that brings us tonight to verse 8, where Jesus gives a commendation to this church. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. The Lord tells this church, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. Well, what exactly is this open door? Well, before we look at what it is, I'd first like to look at Jesus' three commendations to this church for the reason why he opened this door to the church of Philadelphia. Again, Jesus tells them he opened this door for three reasons. First of all, they had a little strength. The Greek word for strength there is dunamis. It's the Greek word for power. Now remember, guys, this wasn't a word of condemnation. It was a word of commendation. In other words, this was not a negative comment. This was not a negative comment on their feebleness, we'll say. No, it was a commendation of their faithfulness and their strength. The church of Philadelphia was small in number. That's true. And Jesus said, I know your church. I know your works. I know that you're a small, struggling church. You're not a prosperous church like the church down the road, which we'll study next week. But in the eyes of the world, you might be considered to be a failure. Maybe even in the eyes of other Christians. Small churches are often seen as failures. Uh, there's a well-known megachurch pastor that said, if your church is small, you're dishonoring God by existing. Roll your church into a bigger church. That's because some people use certain criterion for success that God doesn't use. This is one of those times Jesus is correcting the record. He said, I know that you're a small church, small in number. But the impact that you've had on your city has been huge and powerful because you are ministering faithfully in the power of my Holy Spirit is what Jesus is telling them. It could also be, guys, that many, if not most, of its members of this small church were poor. You know, from the lower classes of their society. But with Paul, they could say then, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, listen, for when I am weak, then I am strong. One thing about a small church, we have to depend on God to do everything. We're weak. We know we're weak. We don't have the uh, resources that many large churches have. We don't have the plethora of servants that many churches have. We have a few faithful saints. We have a little strength, uh, a few resources. 
which means we have to rely on God. We have to rely on God. You know, we're kind of in that place where Jesus taught us how to pray in uh, the Gospels, give us this day our daily bread. Well, uh, when you're a small church, that's kind of what we, how we pray. Lord, give us this day what we need to survive. And he does. And it keeps us on our knees. It keeps us close to him. That's why Paul said, when I'm weak, I am really strong. So I'm not depending on my strength. But guys, despite, despite its small size, spiritual power flowed in the church of Philadelphia. Listen, people were being redeemed. Lives were being transformed, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was being proclaimed. One pastor compares this last day's church with the teaching from many pulpits today. He said, and I quote, There are those who teach that in the last days there will be a major manifestation of the sons of God. In fact, there is a group called the Manifest Sons of God. And uh, the latter rain movement, these are two ultra-charismatic uh, movements that believe that God has talked to them and revealed to them that right before Jesus returned, there would be a great outpouring of the Spirit around the world. People would be raised from the dead. All sicknesses would be eradicated. Incredible things would be taking place. This pastor is saying that he disagrees with that. Let me continue. There are those who teach that in the last days there will be a major manifestation of the sons of God. That miracles will happen wherein every sick person is healed and glorious things will occur. But I believe that's hype and hyperbole. Yes, there are some good things happening, but it's the time of little strength. Jesus does not commend this, does not say this condemningly. He merely says that's the way it is during the age of Philadelphia. This is the age we are in. We are living at a time just prior to Jesus' return. A time when many are saying it's going to be the greatest revival in the history of the church. I hope so. But I don't read that in my Bible. And I think Jesus is saying to this good, solid, spirit-filled church, you're small. Because right before my return, we're not going to see a great strength in the church where there's numerous churches. It's going to be small faithful churches in the midst of great apostasy in the church. It's hype and hyperbole, this pastor says. Yes, there are many, there are some good things happening, but it's the time of little strength. Jesus does not say this condemningly. He merely says that's the way it is during the age of Philadelphia. Thus, it's not an, ind it's not an indictment, but rather an honest assessment of the last day's church, end quote. Guys, as I read my Bible, and I hope I'm wrong, apostasy and not worldwide revival is the bi biblical prediction for the last day's church. So first of all, they had a little strength, but that strength came from the Holy Spirit, and they ministered faithfully in it. The second word of commendation is they kept his word. Like Job, they could say, Job 23, verse 12, I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The church of Philadelphia represents the true church in the last days. The true church in the last days. Not the denominational church, which for the most part, no longer even believes in the inspiration of the word of God, let alone teaches it faithfully. However, it's not just denominational churches that are no longer teaching the word. Many so-called evangelical churches are not teaching God's word faithfully anymore either. That, that shouldn't surprise us because it's the very thing Paul warned us would happen in the last days prior to Christ's return. He mentioned that this very thing would characterize the church in the last days. 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4. He said to Timothy, Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time when, will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The they is churchgoers. It's not the world. The world's never endured sound doctrine. 
By the way, sound doctrine comes from a Greek word that means healthy teaching. It's where we get our word hygienic from, healthy. People are not going to want in the last days, churchgoers in general, are not going to want to hear healthy teaching from God's word. But Paul goes on to say, but rather they're going to heap to themselves teachers who will tickle their ears, telling them what they want to hear will turn away from God's truth and be turned aside to fables. Fables like it's God's will that everyone be healed. Everyone drive Cadillacs. Everyone live in the best houses in town. That it's God's will that you drive the best car in town to drive a, a, a Chevy when you could be driving, you know, a Mercedes. That's not humble. That's ridiculous. That dishonors God. You're a child of the king, they say. I mean, doesn't God want you to have the best as his ch children? This is the mentality. That's a fairy tale. That's a fable. That's not consistent with what the word of God teaches. This is what we're living with. We're in those days. It's getting harder and harder to find pastors who will teach God's word to, uh, God, the word of God to their people, listen, faithfully. And I believe in verse-by-verse -verse teaching. Because that's the only way you can get the whole, give people the whole counsel of God. But it's getting harder and harder. That used to be the staple in the church, teaching God's word verse by verse. I'm not against topical teaching by any means. But in the course of your teaching, some at point during the week, there should be verse by verse teaching. It's getting harder and harder to find men and women of God that teach the Bible verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, that have not been co-opted by the culture have become man pleasers cranking out man-centered warm fuzzy happy meals from the pulpit instead of hard-hitting truth the good the bad the ugly from god's word you know stuff that steps on toes and challenges us and even rebukes us if we're not living according to his word it's the only way we're going to get right number three third commendation they did not deny his name. In Scripture, the name of God represents his person and his character. You remember when Moses, uh, God sent him to, to Pharaoh to tell him to let my people go. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh that. And Moses said, well, what if he asked me who is sending me? I don't even know your name. And so God revealed his name to Moses. You don't have to turn there. You can look it up later. But in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 7, So the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, listen, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We get the picture of, of, of a God who's both loving and merciful, but also righteous and, and just. A God who is who condescends to stoop down, to reach out to man to be saved, but is a holy God and dwells in unapproachable light. He's so holy. This is, the God, this is his name. This is who he is, right? When Jesus commends the Christians in the church of Philadelphia for not denying his name, the idea is this. You have, deni you have not denied my deity. You have faithfully represented me to those in your community. That I am fully God in human form. The great I am. The only way to the Father. This church was faithful in proclaiming Jesus to the people of their community. Well, we know that there has been a war against God's word working through the church ever since the church was born. There has been a war against God, his word, and his son. I'll have you turn to these. They're familiar to you. 2 Corinthians 11. These are warnings to be on guard against the enemy's attacks with regard to to the word of God, the truth of God, and ultimately the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 11, 
verses 3 and 4. I'll read it to you out of the NLT 2nd edition. Paul said, But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. You know any Christians like that? There's no discernment. There's no testing all things and holding fast to what is good, what is of God. It's whatever they hear on Christian radio uh, or on TV. They're the most gullible people. And Paul said, you know, you Corinthians, you're like that. You're not discerning at all. You just take everything in. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the, than the one I preach to you. Or, you know, they, they, they offer you a different spirit than the one you receive from us. Or that someone will give to you uh, another gospel than the one you believe that saved you. Second Peter 2, verse 1. Peter said, but there were also false prophets among God's people, I'll paraphrase, in the Old Testament period, even as there will be false teachers among you in the church age, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, teachings that will damn a person to hell if believed. Even, listen, denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction and many, will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Guys, this is going to keep going. In fact, it's going to escalate the more we, the closer we get to Jesus' return. Right? Look, if there wasn't a market for false teachers, they wouldn't be around. Somewhere along the line, the church has moved from being you know, Christ-centric, the cross, to being man-centric, self and when that happened, everything shifted. Everything changed. And truth went out the window in the process. Because the goal now in church, many churches is to build a big church. You can't do that by preaching, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. That doesn't work anymore. So now you got to preach a, a felt needs centered message. You know? Where God, you know loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life which includes health and wealth and success and the true message of the gospel is being pushed farther and farther from the church until we come to this haunting statement by Jesus in Luke chapter 18 verse 8 nevertheless when the son of man comes will he really find faith on the earth I just read an article today. I saved it. It was uh, a survey done by Ligonier Ministries. And they discovered that 30... Listen, I, I, you, you may not believe this. It's hard to believe. They said that 30% of U.S. evangelicals, not Roman Catholics or mainline Protestants, 30% of U.S. evangelicals don't believe that Jesus is God. When I return, will I really find faith on the earth? Revelation 3, verse 8. Again, I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Listen, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Those two go hand in hand, by the way. Henry Morris, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, says, and I quote, When a church begins to deal loosely with the word of Christ, it will sooner or later deny the name of Christ. The name Jesus means salvation. And, no, and one who honors his name accepts the great salvation provided by his substitutionary atonement and justifying resurrection. One who honors the name Christ acknowledges his person, his threefold eminence as God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. One who honors him as Lord believes and obeys his word. 
End quote. Those who are truly his will never deny his name. Those who deny his name don't belong to him. The Mormons believe that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. Lucifer was the bad sheep. Jesus remained faithful to the Father. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. And we can go on and on about people who have distorted, um, dis destroyed Jesus' name in the sense that they have a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. In that regard, they have denied his name. They have denied who he really is, right? One pastor put Jesus' words to his church, to this church, this way. He said, you recognize I am who I claim to be. Not just an interesting teacher, not just a model of how to live successfully, or how to have prosperity, or how to be happy that I am the Christ, end quote. That's what Jesus is really saying here. Now, guys, these three things are how Jesus gauges success in any Christian church or ministry. In other words, it's not about how large and wealthy a church is that determines their success in his eyes. I mean, that's the world's criteria for gauging success. How big is it? How wealthy is it? Jesus considers a church successful when they are being led by and are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, regardless of their size, when they have kept, when they keep his word, when it would be easier to compromise with the world, but they don't. And number three, a church is a success in Jesus' eyes when they don't deny his name in favor of some, you know, politically correct Jesus. Look, we believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Right? Amen. God Almighty, second person of the Trinity, who became a man, died for our sins, the third day rose from the dead, ascended back to his Father, and is coming again to judge the living and the dead and to establish a kingdom that will never end. That's our Jesus. Now, because of these three things, Jesus set before this church and all churches that are like them an open door which no one could shut. Yes, you say, but again, what is this open door? Well, many believe it's the open door for ministry, primarily for evangelism. Now, I'll give you four scriptures. I'll just read them to you. Four scriptures that come out of the New Testament that I think prove conclusively what this open door probably is. Acts 14, 27 now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had, listen, opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Opened the door to reach the Gentiles for Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. Paul said, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. A great and effective door for ministry and primarily for evangelism. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, furthermore, Paul said, When I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. An opportunity to share God's word. And then Colossians 4, verse 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, the gospel, for which I am also in chains. So I think we're on solid ground to interpret this open door, listen, as a door of spiritual opportunity to preach the gospel. The church in Philadelphia had a heart to reach the lost. And because of it, the Lord gave them the desire of their heart and opened a door for, of opportunity for ministry and evangelism. And we need to notice this, okay? Notice that Jesus opens the door of spiritual opportunity for ministry. Jesus does. And when he opens that door, look, no one can shut it. Right? No one can shut it. Now, I bring that out because if you watch any Christian TV, there are a multitude of TV, TV preachers that try to 
manipulate you out of your money. Well, maybe not you guys, but they try to manipulate people out of their money by telling them something along these lines. If you don't send your money in for the work of God, the work of God will come to an end through our ministry is the idea. So what they're saying is, if you don't send money in to their ministry, the door of ministry will be shut. Well, if the door to their ministry can be shut by man, it was opened by, by man and not by God. And I always say, look, when they tell me, if you don't send your money in right away, the precious work of God being done through this ministry will come to a screeching halt. I say, amen, Lord, let it come to us a halt. Because I believe where God guides, he provides. I don't have to beg for money. I think it dishonors God when we beg people to support his work as if he's not capable of supporting his own work. What kind of a God do we have if we think that way? God doesn't need my money. He doesn't need your money. He allows us the privilege of using our money to work, build the kingdom. We get the eternal rewards from that, but God certainly doesn't need us. So any ministry or so-called minister is on TV or, or whatever else and telling people, look, if you don't send your money in right away, this, this, the work of this precious, the precious work of this ministry will come to a stop. I let that work die because it's not of God. When Jesus opens the door to ministry, no one can shut that until he decides to shut it, whenever that is. Now, as we said earlier, guys, in previous studies, and even this evening, at this point in these seven letters, there is usually some words of condemnation and correction. But we don't see that in the letters to Smyrna and Philadelphia. And so Jesus, the Lord Jesus, moves right into the challenge, which takes the form of an exhortation and promise. Verse 9, Indeed, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. In the early years of the church, first century stuff, much of the persecution the early church faced right after it started was from Jews who saw Christianity as a cult, as a cult of Judaism. All right? Paul the Apostle, well, he was Saul of Tarsus at that time, he believed they were a cult too. And he was zealous to destroy this cult who had, which had branched off Judaism. What do I mean? Well, you see, the early church taught, we got it from Paul and the other apostles, that Judaism was the root and Christianity was the fruit. We talk about Judeo-Christianity. You can't divorce one from the other. That Judaism, or the first covenant, the old covenant under Moses, laid the groundwork for the new covenant in Christ. So they went on out and began to preach that message. Well, guess what? The Jews who had devoted their whole life to Judaism didn't care for that message all that much. And so they began to persecute the Christians. They began to call them a cult of Judaism which needed to be destroyed. And that's what Saul of Tarsus was uh, busy uh, about doing when the Lord stopped him on the road to Damascus and he had his conversion experience. He realized... He was on the wrong side. Christianity wasn't a cult. They were the truth. And Paul became one of our champions in the Christian faith. But initially, the Jews thought Christianity or Christians were members of a cult. And um, Jesus had some strong words for these Jews. He called these unbelieving Jewish haters of the gospel a synagogue of Satan. In other words, they saw themselves, these Jews, Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, etc. They saw themselves as a synagogue of God. The word synagogue is a word that means a Jewish assembly or congregation. 
So they saw themselves as a synagogue serving God. In other words, doing the work of God in destroying this cult called Christianity. But in reality, Jesus saw them as a synagogue of Satan, a group of Jews doing the, doing the work of the devil in persecuting and killing the true people of God, the Christian church. You know, it's amazing how zealous someone can be for a cause they believe in. It's amazing how, how zealous someone can be for a lie, thinking it's the truth. Didn't Paul say that of the Jews in Romans 10? They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I mean, they're zealous, but they don't have the truth in their hearts. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going around trying to establish their own system of righteousness, have not submitted to God's righteousness, the gospel, Jesus Christ, and so on. We see this all the time, not just in you know, religious circles, you see it in political circles. You see, you see people who are completely sold out to a, a, a political ideology or group. They are so convinced this group is right and what they believe is true that they embrace it. Well, they'll lay down their lives in some case for it. Remember what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end thereof is the way of death. In Jesus' day, the Jewish religious leadership were absolutely convinced that they were right in everything. Nobody could teach them anything because they had a corner on truth. In fact, they were the only ones who really understood the truth of God, right? And yet Jesus said in John 8, 44, to these very scribes and Pharisees, he said to them, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Any person or group that wants to destroy, to kill, persecute God's true church is obviously not working for God. All right? They're on the wrong team. They don't think that. They don't understand that. But, you know, the ultimate example of this is going to be when the Antichrist rises to power and his false prophet, the one who organizes the world church, Antichrist, the one world government. Millions upon millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people will get behind the Antichrist and his new religious system where he is worshipped as God. They are going to absolutely be convinced that this is the truth and they're going to persecute and kill anyone who disagrees with them we might be seeing a little foreshadowing of this right now in our society people are getting used to fighting against and even killing anyone who disagrees with them because they have the truth it has become a religious thing in their minds Religious zeal is the most powerful zeal a person can embrace. And that's why the people on the left today, it's no longer a, a, a debating of ideas. That ended a long time ago. Theirs is a religious zeal. And if you deny them, you're denying their God, and they will destroy you because you're evil. Conservatives, we're not just those who need to be uh, taught a different way of thinking. If we have a different way of thinking, we are now those who should be targeted and canceled. Cancel the culture, but I'm talking now physically canceling at one point. But we've seen that kind of a mentality in church circles for centuries, especially those who claimed they were Christians. I told you I've grown, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. For many, many years, the greatest persecutor and killers of God's true church were those who professed faith in Christ, the Roman Catholic Church. I'm doing this from the top, off the top of my head, but I forgot what pope it was. He killed in one day more Christians than the Roman Empire killed in 300 years. I mean, it's incredible. Again, verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say 
they are Jews and are not. How could somebody be born a Jew but really not be a Jew? Well, you've got to read Romans 2, verses 28 and 9. Where Paul says just because a person has the blood of Abraham in their veins doesn't mean they have the faith of Abraham in their heart. Ishmael had the blood of Abraham in his veins. He was an unbeliever. Whereas Jacob, I'm sorry, whereas, uh, you know, Isaac was the son of promise, had the blood of Abraham in his veins, but the faith of Abraham also in his heart. You can be a Jew by birth and not be a believer, and you can be a Gentile by birth but have the faith of Abraham and be more of a spiritual Jew than many who are physical Jews. Be more of a Jew. That I'm going to make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come before and be, uh, come, make them come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you. Well, keep your finger there because I want to bring in a parallel passage. Turn to Matthew 19. I believe this is a parallel passage to that very statement by Jesus. Here's something he taught when he was on the earth during his earthly ministry. Matthew 19, verse 28. So Jesus said to them, talking to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, in other words, when I come and the kingdom age is established, the first thing I'm going to do, and we've talked about this, he's going to judge Israel and judge the Gentiles before the kingdom age will officially begin. Unbelievers will not be allowed into the kingdom. It has to be those who are believers. All right? He said, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying that someday, and he's talking about this time of judgment before the kingdom age begins. He is saying that unbelieving Israel will come and worship before the Christian church. Now, don't misunderstand this. This is not the kind of worship that we worship God with. The Greek word is proskuneo. It's, it, and it means to bow down to, to pay obeisance to a king or a governor or somebody who has a superior authority over you. It's not a holy word. We Sure, we use it because God is the ultimate superior being with regard to us. So we use it in the sense that we worship him as God. But it's not a holy word in the sense it can't be used uh, just from one person to another. In those days, they would, they, it literally means to kiss toward, proskuneo, to kiss toward. And the idea was you would kiss the hand, you would bow, you would kneel, you would kiss the hand of a king or a governor or somebody who was of superior authority. Someday, unbelieving Israel is going to come and, and kneel at the feet or prostrate themselves at the feet of the church and confess that the church of Jesus Christ was God's true people. His true people. That he really did love them. And they were wrong. They were had embraced a, a, a false system. It wasn't the true worship system that God brought to the earth through Christ. But of course, if they wait till that day to bow the knee to Jesus and to prostrate themselves in front of the Christian church, it's going to be too late. Today is the day of salvation. You want to be saved today, you have to bow the knee to Christ and acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior. Many will wait until it's too late. To wait to the day of judgment, they will bow. They will confess Jesus is, Christ, is Lord of all. But it will be too late for them to do it at that point. And then the Lord Jesus gives to this church, again, which represents the true church on the earth at the time of the rapture. He gives this church a promise, a promise that is generated, listen, much controversy and debate as to its true interpretation. Let me read again verse 10, or let me read to you verse 10, where Jesus said, because you have kept, now he's talking to the church of Philadelphia, which again represents the true church of Jesus Christ in the last days. I believe for the most part the evangelical church. 
not the denominational church made up of Catholics, Protestants, and as we're going to see next week, liberals. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The word uh, persevere is a Greek word that means faithfulness under pressure. Faithfulness under pressure. We would say that this church was a faithful church that hung in there. That's our expression. That hung in there through the persecution they were facing. And they didn't quit. They didn't bail. They didn't run away. And this is where Jesus' promise comes into play now. A controversial promise because a lot of people don't agree on what it really means. We'll look at it right now. But in light of this church's faithfulness, hanging in there, uh, not being compromised, not running away, but being a light in the darkness and so on, Jesus makes them a promise. As we just said a moment ago in verse 8, when Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia that he, that he has set before them an open door, we said this is probably referring to an open door of spiritual opportunity to preach the gospel. However, some believe, one of them is Donald Gray Barnhouse, who, who has written a phenomenal commentary on the book of Revelation, Donald Gray Barnhouse. He and others believe that this open door is much more than that. Much more than that. They believe this could be talking about, listen, an open door of deliverance. An open door of deliverance. Deliverance out of the tribulation period the tribulation period that is coming upon this Christ-rejecting world at one point. And if that's true, then verse 8 becomes a segue into verse 10. And the promise that Jesus gives to the last day's church that is faithful to him and his word. Listen, verse 8. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, many Bible commentators, many pastors, including myself, interpret Jesus' words, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. Many interpret that, including myself, to mean that this is a promise by Jesus that he is going to rapture his true church, which Philadelphia again represents, off the earth, listen, before God unleashes the tribulation period judgments upon this Christ-rejecting world, which we will study in chapters 6 through 19. Those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture, in other words, the rapture will take place after the tribulation period, those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture of the church say that what Jesus is promising his church is that he would protect them, listen, through the tribulation period and then rapture them off the earth once the tribulation period is finished and that he is not, listen, he is not, they say, promising the, the, uh, us as the true church, not promising us that he is going to take us off the earth before the tribulation period takes place. But notice, guys, that Jesus doesn't say he will keep his true church through the tribulation period, but that he will keep his true church from. The Greek is ek, ek, and can be translated from, or out of. He is going to keep his true church from or out of the hour of trial, another way of saying the tribulation period, coming upon the whole world. Look, if the Lord Jesus had wanted to express the idea that his church would remain upon the earth during the entire tribulation period, but that he would protect his church through it, well, he could have used the Greek prepositions en, which is the word for in, 
or dia, the Greek preposition for through, and not the one he chose to use, ak, which means out of. If he wanted to communicate the truth that the post-tribulationists embraced and believed this promise is teaching, that Jesus Christ is going to preserve his church through the tribulation. We're going through the tribulation, folks. That's what they believe as the church of Jesus Christ. But he's going to preserve us through it. He could have used the Greek preposition dia, through. But he chose the preposition ek, out of. He was going to take his church out of the world before the tribulation period began. Another, another problem with um, the interpretation that those who hold to a post-tribulation rapture view of this passage and that Jesus is here promising his church uh, preservation, you know, in and during and through the tribulation, uh, there's problems with regard to that that others have picked up on. One author put it this way, and I quote, Believers in that terrible time will not be preserved. So they're saying the post-trib, you know, what Jesus promises is to preserve his church through the tribulation period. The author says, but they're not preserved. All right? In fact, many will be martyred. He quotes chapter 6, 9 through 11, chapter 7, 9 through 14. He said, leading to the conclusion that promising preservation is meaningless if the believers face the same fate as sinners during the tribulation. To get around this, he says, some hold that the promise of deliverance is only from God's wrath during the tribulation. But a promise that God will not, excuse me, the author says, but a promise that God will not kill believers, but will allow Satan and Antichrist to kill them would provide a small amount of comfort to the suffering church of Philadelphia representing the true church who would be going through the tribulation period, end quote. Yeah, this idea is ridiculous, right? Well, Jesus is going to preserve his church through the tribulation, but they're not preserved. Believers are martyred by the thousands and hundreds of thousands. John sees a number of martyred saints in chapter 7 so numerous, he can't even count them. Well, then it only means that they'll be preserved from God's wrath. Okay, so God won't kill him, but he'll let Satan and the Antichrist kill him. Oh, that's a big comfort. <laughs> Why do you just accept what the Bible is clearly teaching and let go of your little preconceived theological construct about the rapture? Furthermore, guys, to bolster the argument that Jesus is promising to remove his church from the earth entirely before the tribulation period begins, the Lord Jesus himself says in verse 10, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. The word hour is not referring to a literal 60-minute period of time, but to a general or symbolic period of time, in this case the seven year tribulation period. Uh, wasn't a church hole that talked about a church hill I should say that talked about you know our darkest hour. Didn't mean our, the darkest 60 minute period in you know history. An hour, just indeterminate period of time, right? Uh, symbolic uh, term, right? Using used for a time period that um, at that point um, people facing World War II didn't know how long it was going to last. But we do know that this hour is going to last seven years. It's, I believe, a reference to the seven-year tribulation period that the Lord is going to keep his true people from. The Greek word for trial is perismos, and it means adversity, trouble, trial, or tribulation. Tribulation. So here Jesus promises to keep the last day's true church from the period of trouble or tribulation. In other words, the entire tribulation period, which again is coming upon the whole world. I like what author and scholar Mark Hitchcock had to say on this. He said, and I quote, Notice Jesus promises to keep his people from the hour of testing that is coming upon the whole world. 
The Lord promises to keep his people not just from or out of the testing, but from the very time, he calls it an hour, the whole seven-year period of the testing. The exemption of believers is not just from the trials of the tribulation, but from the very tribulation itself. This means that the church will be immune from the very hour or the very time period when this testing occurs, that is, from the tribulation period itself. The most natural meaning of this promise is that believers will not be on the earth when the hour of trial takes place. This conclusion is bolstered by the next verse where Jesus said, said I am coming quickly. The inference is that he will deliver his people from the time of worldwide testing by his coming for them. Hitchcock says this strongly supports the pre-tribulationist notion of removal from the time of the tribulation, not the post-tribulationist idea of protection through it. He concludes, Revelation 3 verse 10 is a specific special promise from Jesus that his bride will be kept from the hour of testing or the time of tribulation that is coming upon the whole world. This strongly supports the pre-tribulation view of the rapture. As Professor John Walvoord notes, quoting him now, the event in view here that will deliver the true church from the tribulation is the rapture, which must occur prior to the tribulation for this promise to have its full force, end quote. Now guys, verse 10, as it's recorded in the King James Version, I think, uh, more closely represents the play on words the Greek is going for. Uh, verse 10 in the King James Version reads this way, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And again, guys, this is a play on words in the Greek. Let me paraphrase or give it to you just simply. Uh, Jesus said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the great tribulation. Let me give you a little heads up warning, okay? Uh, when Jesus says, because you have kept the word of my patience, it doesn't mean, listen now, it, he's not saying, because this church uh, was obedient and hung in there uh, during some hard times, you know, endured many hard things for Jesus' sake, that he is telling them, because you have hung in there and you have been faithful, you have earned my deliverance. No, that's not what he's saying. Not what he's saying. This is not what he is saying here. Greek scholar Vincent put it this way. He said, and I quote, not the words which, which Christ has spoken concerning patience or perseverance, but the word of Christ which requires patience or perseverance to keep it. The gospel which teaches, he's talking about the gospel, which teaches the need of a patient waiting, of a persevering, okay, um, for Christ, end quote. In other words, he's not saying, not using it like a verb. You need to do this, persevere, and if you persevere, then I will keep, keep you from the great tribulation. No, he is saying, what I'm telling you, the gospel that I've given you to proclaim uh, is going to require perseverance. But that perseverance, listen, will be an evidence that you truly belong to me. We have to understand that, okay? Uh, we often read the Bible and, and, and assume what God is, these, like these are conditional promises. If you do this, then I will do that. But nothing we receive from God is based on what we earned, Okay? Everything God gives us is a gift of his grace. So when, when, when Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit, you know, true believers will bear fruit. He's not saying, if you bear fruit, you will be a true believer, and I'm going to take you to heaven someday. He is saying, if you are a true believer, you will bear fruit. I've said it before, let me say it again. The fruit on an apple tree doesn't make it an apple tree, it just bears witness that it is an apple tree. The fruit in a person's life doesn't make them a Christian. They're not working uh, at becoming a Christian through their fruit bearing. The fruit in their life is an evidence that they are born again, connected to Jesus divine, 
and his life is flowing through them and producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is an evidence that they belong to him. You, you get that? I don't want you to read this and go, oh, he's making them a conditional promise. If you don't persevere, you're not going to make it. I'm going to not take you out of the world before the truth. No, that's not what he's saying. And I, and I bring that out because... The New Testament warns us that in the last days, a great apostasy, the word apostasy means a falling away or a departing from the faith. The New Testament warns us, and we touched on it briefly just a minute ago, but it warns us that in the last days, a great apostasy would take hold in the church. Not a gigantic revival. I'm not saying that there's not going to be any pockets of revival anywhere in the church throughout the world. I hope and pray there's a big one right here where we are, in Chicago, in its suburbs. I'm just saying that does not seem to be consistent with what the Bible says will be the conditions upon the earth, spiritually speaking, just prior to Christ's return. We're not going to see great revivals accompanied by great miracles people being raised from the dead all over the earth, uh, you know, that kind of thing, you know, he, he, healings everywhere, and so on, and people getting saved all over the place. I believe with all my heart that right now as we're speaking, probably somebody in somewhere in the world is being raised from the dead. I, I believe God's still doing miracles. That, that somebody right now as we're talking is being healed of some incurable disease. God is still working. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But at least in America, because we have become so soft and so lacking in faith, we don't really need to trust God for our daily bread. We have so much, right? And that has impacted the way we believe, and we don't really. For the moment, I'm just saying, you know, you guys in this room, I'm just talking in general. Remember that quote by Blackaby? Henry Blackaby, he said, um, Today evangelical Christians are conservative in their theology, but are practical atheists. We have it all nailed down in our head. We believe all the right stuff. We just don't see it translated into our lives because we really don't believe for you know, the moment. We believe for the future. We believe in, for the past. I was saved. And I gave, gave my heart to Christ 20 years ago. I, I was saved. I, I believe that. I believe Jesus is coming in the future. He's going to rapture his church. He's going to come back and establish his kingdom. I believe all that. What about right now? Well, you know. What about the person that's got stage 4 cancer? How, how much faith do you pray over a person like that? Well, we don't really. Usually. Not, not everybody. We probably have more faith praying over a cold than cancer, but why? Is cancer harder for God to heal than a cold? Of course not. But we bring our own limitations into our relationship with God. If we can't see how men can do it, God can't do it. We wouldn't say it that way, but in the back of our mind, that's kind of how we're thinking. So we're conservative in our theology, but we're practical atheists. But the New Testament, and we'll end on this, the New Testament warns us that in the last days, a great apostasy, a great falling away from the faith would come into the church. Paul the Apostle in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, said, in the last days men, and of course men, women, he's talking about churchgoers, churchgoers would have a form of godliness, but would deny the power thereof. Many churchgoers in the last days would have a form of godliness, but would deny the power thereof. What does that mean exactly? What does that mean exactly? Well, I believe it goes along with what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, listen, the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The, 
The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe it and embrace it. You know, make it their own. So this church was not ashamed. Philadelphia was not ashamed of the gospel. Listen. But was clinging to it tenaciously and proclaiming it faithfully. Unlike many today who are ashamed of the gospel. And I'm not talking about liberal churches. Liberal churches have always been ashamed of the gospel. It's too narrow. They are Broadway preachers, aren't they? Liberal pastors are Broadway preachers. They don't like the narrow way that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. Only a few find the way that really leads to eternal life. They don't like that message. They like the Broadway. They like a path that's tolerant and inclusive that has room for all kinds of different people and belief systems and, and, and practices, whether you're gay or whether you're this or what, you know. They want a very inclusive, tolerant way to God. So liberal churches have always been ashamed of the gospel. But today, what we are seeing we had never did see before was in evangelical churches. There are those who are ashamed of the gospel. Now, I'm not saying these are pastors that really know the Lord, but they call themselves evangelicals. What, what do I mean? Well, there's a teaching that has been going around for a while. And it goes like this, and you'd be shocked if I told you some of the well-known Christians who have kind of embraced it. I, I don't know to what degree. I don't know if, you know, maybe with all their heart, but maybe they're giving it some credence. And that is this that we've made the gospel too narrow. Well, have you talk to Jesus. He said it's the narrow way. I didn't make it narrow. He did. <laughs> but they said we've made the way to God too narrow. And here's what they mean by that. If you have a Muslim who has never heard the gospel, if you have a Buddhist who has never heard the gospel, if you, I just said Muslim, Muslim uh, Buddhist, uh, you know, if you have people that have never heard the gospel but are living up to the light that they have, they're good Muslims, they're good Buddhists, they're good, you know, uh, whatever. Here's what they're saying. It's the blood of Jesus that saved. They're not denying that. But what they're saying is because these people have never really heard the gospel and they're good Muslims and good Hindus and good whatever, uh, they're living up to the light they have. Here's what God, God's going to do for them. He's going to take the blood of Christ and apply it to their account, even if they've never heard of Jesus Christ, because they're good people. They are living up to the light that they have. Now, folks, that is so misguided, I don't even know where to begin with it. But let me just say this. If that was really true, what was the Great Commission for? Seriously, think about this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person, right? What was the point of that? If to get to heaven, you just have to be sincere. And, and, and living up to the light, quote unquote, you have whatever that spiritual truth you've embraced is. Best to leave them alone, right? I mean, here's the deal. You go out into the mission field and you preach the gospel to a group of people that have embraced some kind of a, I don't know, voodoo religion or whatever, and they reject the gospel. Now they are accountable. Now they will be going to hell. Best to leave them alone. So leave them alone. Let them practice their religion the way they see fit, best of their ability, in sincerity, because God will take the blood of Christ and apply it to their account. I, I just, we're in the last days. We are in the last days. And, and, and you know, I, and I've talked about this before. And let me just mention it quickly and we'll close. But you have evangelical pastors, and I've read some of their stuff, who will tell you that, that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grab the term. Um, they will tell you that the blood of Christ doesn't save. Doesn't save. Um, uh, uh, P. 
penal substitution. Boy, I tell you what, I'm going to knock it out from back there. <laughs> they deny penal substitution. Penal, punishment, substitutes. Another died in our place. I've read the writings. They mock the idea that the blood of Christ could save you, could wash away your sins. Because for God to punish Jesus for my sins, that's ridiculous. That's, that's sick. You know? I mean, your kid does something wrong, you don't go over and kick the dog. You punish them. This is what is passing for spiritual leadership in the church of Jesus Christ today. This is heresy. Flat out heresy. This we read earlier. Just as there were false prophets among God's people in the Old Testament period, there are going to be false teachers among God's people in the New Testament period who are going to secretly bring in damning heresies. Heresies that will damn you to hell if you embrace them. And they would deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a denial of Jesus Christ to say his blood shed in Calvary's cross is not going to save anybody. It, it won't atone for our sins. But that's where we're at. That's where we are today. So we'll leave it there. We'll pick it up next week. I didn't want to leave it there, but we have no choice. Um, and um, still not done with verse 10 yet. We'll uh, look at that a little more next time. But uh, amazing times. Amazing times. On the one hand, you hear some of these teachings. And as Bible-believing people who love God's word and who study it faithfully, when you hear something like that, you're shocked, you're horrified, right? You're sickened. I, I was sick to my stomach when I heard 30% of professing evangelicals don't believe Jesus is God. I said, what? It, it's ridiculous. If we could take anything positive out of this, know that the Bible says the closer we got to Christ's return, the more the evil, the deception, the demonic deception will be ramped up. We must be getting very close to Jesus' return. And that's the only thing positive I can take away from looking at the church of Jesus Christ today and seeing so much darkness, so much evil, so much false teaching that denies our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that he's coming very soon. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that these things that are coming and have come upon the earth and even upon the church, if we are students of your word, have not taken us by surprise. And we just pray, Lord, for grace to walk in truth. Philadelphia was a small little church that was in the midst of a lot of darkness, but they were a little pinpoint of light. They were faithful. Give us grace, Lord, to be lights in the darkness, faithful, unwilling to compromise, unbending in our devotion to you. A church that might be little, but holds to your word and never would deny your name. We just praise you, Lord. We ask you to keep blessing these studies in your word. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.